Good morning. As we go to the chitas of the day, today where is uh, Thursday, which is the fifth portion in the um, portion of Va of Shemois. We are holding in the book of Exodus. We are holding chapter three, verse number sixteen. Leich v'asafta, go and gather Zikni Yisrael. Go and gather the elders of the Jewish people. V'amayta aleim and tell them, Elakei aviseichem, the God of your father, Nira Eli came to me. Elakei Avram, the God of Abraham, Yitzchak v'yakei. Leimar saying, Pokai pokariti. I have surely remembered Eschem you. And what's happened to you in the land of Egypt? So Rashi says, what means Zikne Yisrael? Yuchadim the Yeshiva, those devoted to study. In general, in the Torah, Zikne does not mean old, it means wise. Because it cannot be old men, because how do you gather in? Elders from 600,000. That will be a very large number. But wise people is not everybody so wise. And tell them, I will bring you out of the land of Egypt, from the affliction of Egypt. To the land of the Canaanites. Al Ered Zavas Khalovidvash to a land of flowing of milk and honey. Verse 18, Vishamalukh, they will hearken to your voice. Uvasa Atta Vizikni Sal and you and the elders of the Jewish people come al Melech Mitzrayim to the king of Egypt. You'll tell him, Ari Naya Lahaya of Ibrim, the God of the the God of the God of the of the Ib of the Jews. Nikra Lecha is calling to you. God is asking that the Jewish people go for three days by Midbar in the desert. So we can service, sacrifice to the Lord our God. So Rashi says, and they will hearken to your voice as soon as you say this expression. I sure remember you. To them, they will hearken to your voice. Why? Because this was the password. Pakad Yifkad. Remember at the end of the book of, of Genesis, Yosef says these words, Pakad Yifkad. So he gave them the password. This password admitted them from Jacob and from Joseph. That with this expression, they will be redeemed. Jacob said to them, God will surely redeem, remember? And Joseph said to them, Pakaid Yifkaid. So if you say those words, Pakaid Yifkaid, the Jewish people will know the, 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 the password, so to say, that it means that, that it's serious business. Ibrim has an extra yud. There's an extra yud in the word Elakei, in the word Ha'ivrim. There's an extra yud, it can be spelled with one yud. But here, God already showed to them that that God will bring the, upon them the 10 plagues. God is calling us, this is an expression of occurrence, Mikra. That means that we suddenly got a calling by God and we need to go out to the desert for three days to sacrifice our, our carbonus to the Abish. Sacrifices to God. Whoopsie, what happened over here? Sorry. Vaniya Daiti and I know Kiloi Yitin Eschem Melech Mitzrayim. And I know that the uh, that the that the that the king of Egypt will not give you permission to go. He'll never give anybody permission to go. That this guy only understands a strong hand. So that says, if I do not show him my mighty hand, meaning as long as I don't show him my mighty hand, it will not let you go. So 
it will not permit layitan. It will not give. In this case, however, Uncle Israel, the Yishmak, you will not permit him. Therefore, I let let you. But God did not let him harm me. So the concept of layitan, he will not give permission. Verse twenty. Veshalachti is yadi. Therefore, I'm going to stretch out my hand, be kaseis mitzrayim, and I will smite Egypt. Bechol niflo eisai with all my wonders, asher eser bekirbe, what I will do in their midst. Va'achrechein, and after that, yishalech eschem, he will send. But right, I'm telling you right now, God says, verse twenty-one. Venasati eschein al mazer beinim mitzrayim, I will put a favor. In the eyes of the Egyptians, even though in their leaders, I'll have to, they will not see this, but the people, and the people have put a kindness in their in their hearts. When you're going to leave, you will not leave empty handed. You're going to see that you're going to leave with a great abundance. And each woman shall borrow from her neighbor. And from the dweller in her house, silver and gold objects, with smallies and garments, with samtem alabenechem on the sechem, and you'll put them on the, your sons and your daughters, and it's saltem es mitzrayim. You're going to empty out Egypt. So Rashi says, from those who live in their house. The next Rashi is. A grammar Rashi, which Rashi proves that the word "nitzaltem," as in Rashi, as the Targum "nitzaltem," is an interesting word. So the Targum translated as "v'sekunun." You're going to empty, and that's what happened. They were empty, and this is all that Rashi proves from all places that the word "nitzaltem," because "nitzaltem" can mean you'll save Egypt. So over here, the meaning it does not mean you're going to save Egypt. You're going to empty out Egypt. You will empty out Egypt. So the not this is a grammar rush. Verse we're holding chapter four, verse number one. By Yah Moshe and Moshe said, By Yeh Mehain LeYaminuli. Moshe said, Wait a second, they're not going to believe me. But LeYishma BeKoli, and they will not listen to my voice. Ki Yemru, they'll say. The Jews are always a skeptic. They will say, "Where did this, where did this Looney Tune come from?" He rose into us, telling us that God showed him. So, where? How do we know that's true? So, we have to have some kind of a sign that you spoke to me. By Amen, Hashem said, "God said to him, 'What is in your hand?" What is in your hand? By Amen, Mati said, "There's a stick in my hand." Sarashi <clears throat> says, "Mazda biyotcha," an unusual spelling over here. It's usually "mazda" in two words. Over here, it's in one word, "mazda." So it's really in the Hebrew. You see, the written over here is "mazda" two words, but in the Torah, that's the way we read it. But in the Torah, it's, it's one word, "mem zayin hey." It's written as one word to imply the meaning. From this mize, so really it's, we should be read mize. We do, that's that's where you see the title is a kri and a ksiv. Is the way it's written and the way it's read. So the way it's written it should have been read mize. But we put a patach underneath the mem. So now it's maze. So if it's maze, really it's two words. But it's written so it can be maze. It's written. Sorry, it's read maze. What is this? But it's Mize, really. It's written Mize. So from this Mize in your hand is liable to be stricken because you you, you suspected innocent Mize. What is me? What is in your hand? So it, you, you, um, you're going to be punished by this thing that's in your hand because ultimately you hit the rock with 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 this stick. So this was the famous stick of Moses, and he hit the rock. And so he's, God said, "You are you're talking against Jewish people. You're talking against my 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 children. You're gonna be hit. You're gonna be stricken because of that. You're gonna have sort of 
yourself because of what's in your hand. But the simple meaning, it simply means God's asking Moshe as a person says to a friend, do you admit that you that this is before you is stone? He answered, yes, well, I'll make it into a tree. So Mazabiyat has the simple meaning. <laughs> I can do anything, what do you mean? If you need to have, a, I can do a, I can turn a stone into a tree, I can turn a tree into a stone, I can turn a st stick into a snake, I can do whatever I want. It's good to be king. He said to him, throw it to the ground. He threw it again, and it turned into a serpent. He turned into a serpent. This is how he hinted to Moshe that he had spoken ill about Israel. And he had adopted the art of a serpent. So again, God shows Moshe Rabbeinu through turning the stick into a, into a snake that uh, comes from the, 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 the Nachash is, a, is the concept of Lush and Hara. Um, uh, and and it, it, come, it became like a serpent. God said to Moshe, Shlach Yot Grab it by its tail. So Moshe Benu took his hand and he grabbed the tail and it became a staff in his hand. There's many in Midrash about this beautiful story between this illustration that you have to grab the thing, you know, you, the concept of talking lush and hara is in our hands. We can stop it or we can continue it to, to talk evil about one another. So this is an expression of taking hold. And there are many such words in scripture. And the men took hold, yachziku, chazak, chazak. Take strength, grab it. Do not let it control you, control it. In order that they believe that the Lord your God revealed himself, the God of your father, Abraham, the God of Abraham, the God of Isaac, and the God of Yaakov. Yei Mashem Eloi Oid and the Abish is telling him another thing. Hei vino yach yodcha bechekecha. Take your hand, put it in your bosom. Yei vino yodcha bechekecha. He put his hand. Yei tzi vino yodcha mitzaraska shalik. And he took out his hand and he was totally covered in leprosy. So with this, it's, un, it's usual for tzadas, leprosy, to be white. You find if you're white later on, we have the laws of leprosy. With this sign, too, he hinted to him that he spoke slanderously. They said they will not believe me. What are you, what are you saying something you don't know? You said that the Jews are not going to believe you. That's Lush Nahara. It's talking evil against people that you haven't been around for many, many years. How do you know? Therefore, he was he was he was he was automatically struck with sadas. And so food we find later, Miriam was also struck with sadas. She got sick with sadas leprosy. So we know that sadas comes from sadas, the spiritual leprosy later on in the Torah in Leviticus. The Torah talks about the whole Pasha Mitsaida, which is Sadas. Mitsaida is Mitsaida. Somebody who talks evil. So here, Moshe Rabbeinu spoke uh, uh, about the Jews in a derogatory term, and he was punished. He was punished with Tzedas. And God said to him, Take your hand and put it back. He took it out. So it turned back to flesh, turned back to normal. By Yetzirah Ashi says, "Me can from this person we learn, from this verse we learn that divine measure of good comes quicker than the measure of retribution. For in the first instance, it does not say from his bus, from his from his bosom. It says that over here, right away, it turned back to flesh. So when it comes to good, it's much quicker. When it comes to retribution." 
Verse they're not going to believe you. If they will not listen to the first sign, the stick turning into a snake, they'll believe you in the next sign. When you will tell them, because of you, I was stricken, because I spoke ill of you, they'll believe you. For they'll always learn that those who trespass against them are stricken with plagues, just the Pharaoh and Avimela. So if you, they don't believe you in the first one, that the, the stick will turn to a snake, they will believe you in the aspect that a Jew should never speak out against another Jew. Because, and anybody should never speak against Jewish people because God does not like when anybody speaks about the Jewish people. Expression in the Torah is, when you speak about a Jewish person, you're talking about the black of my eye. You're talking about the pupil of God's eye. So and therefore, God, we see by Abimelech and Pharaoh, that both of them spoke of, we had evil intentions against a, a, a Jewish person, and they were stricken. God says, what happened? God says further, if they don't believe in these two, these two signs, because again, Jews are not easily to convince. They don't, you can't convince them very easily. And they're not going to hear to you, hearken to your verse. You'll go and you'll take water from the Nile. You'll spill it on the ground. The water you take from the from the from the from the, from the, from the Nile, Bahaya Ladam It'll turn to blood. So Rash over here, he hinted to them the first plague would be the retribution against the gods of Egypt. That was the first plague. Blood that the Nile turned into gut, into blood. The Nile was what they worshipped. That was one of the gave them sustenance. So they used to worship the Nile. The God said the Nile, which is their deity, will turn into blood. Vahaya ma'im. The word vahaya will become, appears twice in the verse. Vahaya imleishim, vahaya ha'ma'im. And it'll be, meaning the water that you will take for the Nile will become blood on dry land. Seems to me that if said, and it will be, the water that you will take. Why does it take two times in that one line? It says twice, Vahaya. Vahaya, Vahaya. Vahaya, Vahaya. It seems to be said that it will be Vahaya, the water that you will take for the Nile will be become Vahaya, blood and dry land. I understand that it means that in his hand it would turn to blood. And also, when it descends on the earth, it will remain as it is. But now the text teaches us that it would become blood until it will not become blood until it hits dry land. And God said to Moshe, said to God, "Be adani, I beseech, I beseech you, God. I am not a man of words." Not for yesterday, nor for the day before yesterday. Even for the time that I'm speaking to you, I have a heavy mouth and a heavy tongue. So, Lamadnu, from here, Rashi says, from here we learn. God was arguing with Moshe for seven days. God was begging Moshe for seven days to go down to Egypt. To go do the job. Moshe Rabbeinu didn't want to take the job. The bush to go down his mission from yesterday, from the day before yesterday, from the time I spoke to you, just at three days, and there are three times God mentioned in the word, adding up to six. He presently in seven days, when he further said to him, send now to whom you will send. Until he became angry in verse 14 and complained about him. All these redundant, all these was because Moshe Rabbein did not want to accept the mission. He did not want to accept position 
higher than his brother. So Moshe Rabbeinu said, you have, a, have my brother. Why are you giving the younger brother? Over here again, the younger brother is taking leadership over the older brother, who is senior and was a prophet. As it said, did I, did I appear to the house of your father when they were in Egypt? Your father means Aaron. Similarly, and made myself known to them in the land of Egypt. And I, I said to them, each man cast away the despicable idols from before your eyes. And that property was said by Aaron. So Aaron is greater than me. Take Aaron. And not only that, Kvat Peh, Moshe Rabbeinu had a lisp. He couldn't speak. He would stutter when he spoke. So he said, first of all, Aaron, take Aaron. Aaron is, is older than me. He's more wiser than me. And he can speak better than me. So God said to me, son, Pel Adam, who gave a mouth to man? By me, Yosem Elaine, who makes a one dumb or deaf, Pikeach or seeing or blah. So what do you <laughs> instead of saying you have a you have a quad pair, I want you to say you need to be able to talk and I, I give you speech. So who taught you to speak when you're being judged before Pyro concerning the Egyptians? Who taught you to speak? I mean, who made the Pharaoh dumb that he did not exert any effort to issue his command to kill you? And who made his servants deaf so they did not hear the command concerning you? And who made the executioner blind so they did not see when you fled from the execution of Plato? Who made all these things? Who, this whole miracle, how'd you get out of Egypt? If a fly couldn't get out of Egypt, you got out of Egypt. Even though they were pursuing you, you got out of Egypt. Who did all that? I did it. I'm God. I am God who did all this. So therefore, therefore, I'm telling you, go. I'm going to be with your mouth. And I will instruct you what to see. No. Biadaini, please God, shlach na biatishla. Send it to whom you would send. What does that mean? Send it to who you would send, with whom you are accustomed to sending. And this is Aaron. Send it. Let Aaron do the job. Ah, another interpretation says, send it to with whom you would send, with somebody else to whom you will wish to send. I am not destined to bring the Jews in the land of Israel and be the redeemer of the future. Why? Let's wait for Mashiach to come. Why? I'm not going to complete the job. So why have me do the part of the job and somebody else do the next? Shlach no tishlach. Let's wait for the ultimate redeemer. Here we see that Moshe Rabbeinu was a prophet himself. Hashem Moshe and God, after seven days, God's wrath was kindled against Moshe. He said, I know that Aaron, your brother, the Levite, he will speak. And behold, he's going towards you. But he will see you. And he will be happy. Look at Rashi over here, how Rashi explains this. Rabbi Yeshua ben Karcha said, in every instance that God, so to say, the Torah says, God kindled, kindling anger, so to say, it's mentioned that God anger was sparked. In the Torah, it states that there was a consequence. It was followed by a punishment. In this instance, however, no consequence is stated. And we don't find a punishment that came from to Moshe after kindling God's anger. Rabbi Yaisi said, so Rabbi Shuv said there was, no, there was no response from God because Moshe Rabbein was an honor. He was humble. Rabbi Yaisi says, here too we, can, we find a consequence. Because Aaron, your brother, the Levite, who was destined to be a Levite and not a priest, I said in the priesthood would emanate from you. 
God says to Moshe, really, not only you would be the, the leader of the Jewish nation, you'd become the Kayan Gadol. But now, I'm taking it away from you. I'm giving it to Aaron. Henceforth, it will not be so, but he, Aaron, will be the priest. And you will stay a lady. So here, there was a consequence. They said there was a consequence. That's why Moshe Rabbeinu was the pre, the Kohen Gadol later on in Peter. Moshe Rabbeinu was the Kohen Gadol for the first seven days of the Mesa Midrash. If the, on the eighth day, which we're going to learn in Leviticus, on the eighth day, he gave it to Aaron to become the Kohen. So Moshe Rabbeinu was a Kohen. He was a Kohen Gadol for seven days. And these are the seven days that he argued with God that he was a Kayan Gadol. So not only did Moshe Rabbeinu lose for not being a Kayan, but his descendants, all his descendants. So really, it would have been that Moshe Rabbeinu's descendants would be Kayhanim. God says, okay, you kindled my wrath, and now you have lost something. And that you will not be a Kayan Gadol, you will not be a Kayan. And therefore, you'll stay a levy, and your children and your grandchildren will always be Levian. And behold, Aaron, your brother, is going out towards you when you go to Egypt. And he, you're worried, you're so worried that Aaron is going to be angry that suddenly I'm passing over him to give you leadership. You should know, not, to, not as you think, that he will resent your attaining high position. Because this Aaron's goodness and humility, Aaron merited the ornament of breastplate, which is placed upon his heart. So Aaron loved his brother. He was not jealous of his brother. He was happy that his brother had leadership. Even though Aaron was a great prophet, he was a leader of the Jewish nation. So Moshe Rabbeinu came. And he gladly gave it to his brother. Even though Moshe Rabbeinu was younger than him. So God says to Moshe Rabbeinu, you're talking about your brother, and you're worried that your brother is going to be jealous of you. You don't have to worry about that. Aaron, the Simach believer, Aaron is happy in his heart. That's why he deserves Aaron, a lover of Jews, and a lover uh, 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 of you, you love, love, a person that loves you. An older brother is not jealous of you. He's happy with your success and with your leadership. But he's going to ultimately become the Kayan Gadol. And he'll carry that breastplate upon his heart to show that he's the love of, of, of a Jew, the love, the love that he has towards you. Verse 15, with love, and you'll talk to him. You'll put the words in his mouth. And I will be with your mouth and his mouth. And you, I will instruct you what you should do. And he will speak to the people. And you will speak, and he'll and he will be your mouth. And you'll be his leader. Now this shows you something. We'll go to the second. That the word lelakim, that we see that when the word lelakim does not only mean a god, it also means leader. We find this many times in the Torah. The word elakim doesn't always mean God. When it comes to the judges, also use the word elakim, which means a judge. A judge is also called elakim. On your behalf, you will speak to the people. This proves that every instance lach, li, lachem, loi, li, and lahem used in conjunction with dibur, whenever it says, with dibur hu lacha, so whenever it says lacha, he will speak to you. Lacha is a hard word in this word. With dibur hu lacha, he will speak to you. Well, it means about for you. So lacha means for you. So Rashi says, wherever it says, li, lachem, loy, lahem, in, in the connection with speech, it means for. Yi, lachalapeh, 
he'll be your mouth, he will be your interpreter because you have a speech impediment. So he will be your interpreter. Lele Kim, so now she says, he, in Hebrew, Lele Kim as a master and as a prince is Lele Kim. But this stick, take this stick in your hand. This stick is going to do all the miracles in Egypt. It's going to come through this matter. According to, to the stick, according to the message, the stick was Yaakov Avinu's stick. And it was Avram Avinu. It was a famous stick all the way to other Mauritian that this stick came about. That completes the Chumash of today. Beautiful Chumash of today. We now turn to the Tanya of the day. We have reached the 12th chapter of Tanya. The 12th chapter of Tanya is what the whole Tanya was written for, the Benini. This is called the Book of the Middleman. It's all in a way, introduction, in a way to the, bain, the, the, the beginning of what this book was written for. The middle man. This is called not the book of the righteous. This is called the book of the middle man. The Alta Rebbe established and established a foundation of the two souls and the concept of the struggle of the righteous and the wicked, all to bring us to this part. To teach us what a real middle man is and really what we should all strive for. We might never be a tzaddik, not even a not complete tzaddik. We, will never, we should never be a Russia. We should always strive to be a Benini, a middle man. What is a middle man? Very important part of, of the Tanya is chapter 12. You'll see actually the Friedrich Rebbe who divided the Tanya divides it into small parts in this chapter. So we should maybe understand this extremely well. So we shouldn't uh, run through a lot. We should do it very small Tanya's in the next uh, two days so that we know chapter 12 extremely well. Bainini, what is a middle man? We will show, the the Alter Rebbe asked this question in the, first, in the beginning of Tanya. What is a, the first chapter? What is a middle man? Doesn't mean half mitzvahs and half avedas. Right? He proved that already. What's a middle man? A middle man is a man who has evil in his heart. He has a nefesh abahamis. It's alive and well. He never lets it overtake him. He never allows his Yetzirah to win. He's always in, 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 in a fighting mode. It never conquers the small city, the body, which is likened to a small city, which is divine and animal soul both wish to dominate. So the uh, Bainini is a guy who has both his godly soul and animal soul. They're both alive and well. They're both in struggling mode. But he never gives in. The slavish beguflachti never allows the godly, the animal soul to take over anything. Which means the three garments. Machshava. Dibura Maisa. He never, so it means even though for a second he thinks might might have a, a, a capability of thought that comes to mind, he pushes it away right away. Even though he has the capability, he wants to say something, he doesn't say it. The Bainini doesn't allow his Yetzirah or his animalistic entity to take control of himself for a second. And that takes a lot of a lot of effort. Because we're not talking about God even doing action. 
We're starting even off on thought. He, he, he might have a moment of, he, he, starts, he starts to think and he stops it. Why does he start to think? Because he has an animal to sell it, live or well. So therefore, not only he has the potential and it's real, it's actually right now he can think something evil and he doesn't allow it. So, so that's, that means the animal soul never overpowers the godly soul, the slavish begot, to clothe itself in the body. Even in his mind, even in his mouth. Until any of the 248 limbs of his body. To make it sin, and to purify it. God forbid. Never allows it to happen. That's the Bainli. So the Bainli is in constant battle mode. Because the Nefesh, if he does not, if he doesn't uh, uh, fight it, it's going to take over. There's no empty space. So therefore, if he's going to allow it, your ne- my nefesh of Bahamas is going to is going to move in. If I'm going to have an empty space, my nefesh of Bahamas will move in. So the God, the the, the bain need always make sure to have his godly entity over busy, busy. Only the three garments. Of the godly soul, they clothe the body. Because everything starts from the thought. So therefore, the the the, the, the Benini understands that if he's going to have an empty thought, or he's going to have an empty a negative thought, it's going to come into an action. So the Benini knows he's not going to allow it. He's not going to allow it. And therefore, Abayni never did a sin. I'm never going to do a sin. Not because he's not capable of doing a sin. Not because he doesn't have potential to do a sin. Because he's not going to allow it. So Abayni has mind over matter. This is a very important concept in, in Tanya. Mind over matter. That means there's matter. It's a real matter. There's a concept of his animalistic soul who's alive and well. He, I have mind over matter. In the expression of Mayach Shalat Alalev, the mind rules the heart. The Benini, the mind rules the heart. That's the Benini. The mind rules the emotions. My, if, I'm, if my mind does not rule my emotions, then my emotions can run havoc. The Bainini makes sure that even his emotions want to run havoc, and his emotions want to take over, the Bainini does not allow that. A Bainini would, would never become a Russian. Not because he doesn't want to become a Russia. Not because he doesn't have potential to becoming a Russia. Because he doesn't allow it. That's it. He doesn't allow it. He's in control. And to be in control for a baby is a lot of work. It's not like a tzaddik that he's already conquered his, his evil. No, his evil is there. Alive and well, and the Bainini knows that, and therefore the Bainini says, I'm in control. So the Rebbe notes the question is a well known with regard to the statement that a Bainini is one who never transgressed. The question is commonly raised if it's if it is it possible 
through repentance to suffer divine service, that one obtains the rank of a bainly despite his previous sins. After repenting, one can rise even to level of a tzaddik. Surely then, why can't he come back to be a bainly? So what does the Alter Rebbe mean when he says a bainly never sinned? Why can a bainly not sin and then do tshuva? The Rebbe answered the question in the following manner. The Alter Rebbe said that a bainly has never transgressed. It does not mean that the bainly never sinned in his life as a human being, but that in his life as a bainly, he has no history of sin. Because a bainly means the guy who is constantly in the mode of, 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 of struggle. He's always ready. So how is it possible for him to sin? It means a bainly can slip for a second and get out of the mode. The bainly present spiritual state is such that sin in the past as well as in the future has no place in his life because he doesn't allow it. He would not sin even if it were the subject of the same temptation and trials which led him to sin in the past. It is therefore true to state that in the perspective of the present state, he never sinned. Likewise, the altered of statement that a baini will never sin is to be understood in the same vein. Not that he can never sin, a baini could sin, he has a potential. But right now, if he's in the mode of a baini, if he's in the mode, he's in the war, he has no time to think about sinning. He's in the trenches. A baini is like a guy in the trenches. He's in the Marines. He is in the mode of, of war. In that mode, he's not going to sit. It's when the, you start to relax when you're going to sit. So therefore, the Bainini could sit in the future if he gets out of the mode of a Bainini. So in essence, we all need to be in the mode of a Bainini. We be the me in the, in the mode of the, of, the, of, 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 of the struggle. We got to realize this is the real war. This is the real war. The real war, that's why it says, who is a strong man? Hakavish is Yitzray. Not a one. Greater is a person that conquers a country than, I mean, greater is a person that conquers his own Yitzhara than conquers a country. Because when you conquer a country, you're finished now, you can relax. But when you Yitzhara, you never, there's no day off. There's no time off. It's in constant mode. And this sounds, as the Alpha Rebbe says later, this sounds a little bit hard on a person that he's in constant mode of battle. But the Alpha Rebbe will add to that later. We have to be joyful with this struggle. We shouldn't be sad of the struggle. We should be in joy. We should take the struggle with joy and happiness. And as the Alpha Rebbe will explain later. So like the Ayurveda never sinned to be understood in the same vein, the intention is not that it's not that it's impossible for him to sin. He does not, after all, lose his freedom of choice. The Bainley has his animalistic soul, so he has choice to sin. Rather, explained above, his present state is such that it precludes him of sinning in the future, despite the trials that the future may bring. Because if I'm in the state of a Bainley, if I'm in the mode of a Bainley, I won't sin. To be classified a true Bainley, one must fulfill these conditions. For, it, for if one's spiritual state precludes his sinning only under present conditions, but he would succumb to sin, were he subject to the temptations of the past or those of the future may bring, then he is in potential a Russia. He could and would sin, except that the prevailing circumstances are not sufficient conduct for him to do so. The same vein, the Alta Rebbe concludes, the name Russia, referring to one who sins in thought, speech, and action, has never again in his state of a Baini been applied to him because he in the mode of a Baini. However, temporarily, for the Baini has reached a state where sin is precluded under any circumstances, whether in the past or the future. This is an important thing. That's why we can all be a Benini. And that's why we all need to try to be a Benini. Because it's about the present. What in the present I am? What happened yesterday? What's going to be tomorrow? 
I don't know. But what happened yesterday is gone. What's going to be in the future, I don't know. Therefore, it's all right now. As the Moshe Rabbeinu turns to the Jewish people, ladies, in the, the, the book of the bottom, he says it's all about today. It's all about the present situation. How are you right now? So don't tell me what you did in the past. You can do true for the past. Don't tell me what you think is going to be in the future. Because who knows what the future is. The question is right now. Right now. Can I control myself? Can somebody say that he can't control himself right now? That's not true. Just because you didn't control yourself in the past does not mean you can't control yourself right now. So right now, in thought, speech, and action, I can control myself. I cannot do the action, even though I want to do the action. I cannot say what I, or what I think I, sh I shouldn't say. And I can stop my thought. Can anybody stop me from stopping my thought? Nobody can. I, I'm the one who can stop my thought. And uh, that's it. So that's the Baini. Baini stops it right now. It's all about the right now, the present situation. So that's important to a Baini. The Baini, it's important to him to realize that the past he can rectify with Shuvah. The future, he doesn't have to worry about. He has to worry about the right now. Because right now, the war is in front of him. Right now. And right now, everybody can be a Baini. Right now, we can do what, is, what, it, what the Torah wants us to do. Okay, that completes the uh, Tanya of the day. Today is the 19th day of the month, my friends, which starts on chapter 90 till chapter 96. So the six chapters of Tillim, 90, 91, 92, 93, 94, 95, and 96. And you do the chitas of the day. Today, the Yom Yom talks about doing the chitas, the Alter Rebbe, Established the Chumash of the day, that everybody should learn Chumash, uh, the portion of the day with Rashi, which we did. And later on, the Fidik Rebbe established learning the Tanya of the day and saying the Tilim of the day. So the Chitas, which is Chitas, Chumash, Chas is Chumash, Taf is Tilim of Tanya, and Taf is Tilim, Chitas of the day. So we do the Chumash, Tilim, and Tanya of the day. I wish you all a good day in Mitchum today at 10 o'clock. We will do the JLI class, the portion of the week, the portion of Shemais. You can either come to Chabad or you can come to this place on uh, either on Zoom, this Zoom number, or to Facebook slash I wish you all a wonderful and happy day.